good to be with you again in Porto Vogue, and we do appreciate all who have come. My reading this afternoon is in the Gospel of John and in chapter 3. John's Gospel and chapter 3. John chapter 3, I'm reading at verse 1. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. Same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles that thou doest, except God be with him. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, or born from above, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Verse 6, that which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I said unto thee, ye must be born again. The wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof but canst not tell whence it cometh and whether it goeth, so is every one that is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus answered and said unto him, How can these things be? Jesus answered and said unto him, Art thou a master, or art thou the teacher of Israel, and knowest not these things? Verily, verily, I say unto thee, We speak that we do know, and testify that we have seen, and you receive not our witness. If I have told you earthly things, and you believe not, how shall ye believe if I tell you of heavenly things? And no man hath ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man, which is in heaven. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. That will suffice for our reading, and we know with the Lord's blessing. John's Gospel, chapter 3, is really the story of how two teachers met. One was a man by the name of Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. The other was none less than the Son of God, the Lord Jesus Christ. I want you to notice that both these men acknowledged each other as a teacher, said Nicodemus to the Lord Jesus, we know that thou art a teacher come from God, for no man to do these miracles that thou doest, except God be with him. So Nicodemus acknowledged the Lord Jesus as a teacher. you notice that the Lord Jesus acknowledged Nicodemus as a teacher. He says, art thou the teacher of Israel, and knowest not these things? But what I want you to notice this afternoon is this, that one teacher, the Lord Jesus, is going to teach the other teacher. And he's going to teach him two of the greatest lessons a person can learn in life. He's going to teach him two great musts. He's going to teach him, first of all, the must of the new birth. Said the Lord Jesus to this man, marvel not that I said unto thee, you must be born again. But not only did he teach him the must of the new birth, he also taught him the must of a saviour uplifted upon a cross. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. It was a great evening when Nicodemus learnt these two vital musts. And it would be a good meeting for you if someone was to learn them 
for the first time. There must have been born again. You must be born again. And there must of a Savior uplifted at the cross. Why was the Savior lifted up upon the cross? What a message. That whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. No doubt Nicodemus came to the Lord Jesus that evening. In Carlin, was he the Messiah? Was he going to set up his kingdom? Was he going to reign on earth? said the Lord Jesus to this man, except a man be born again, except a man be born from above, he cannot see the kingdom of God. The Savior was reminding this man, as we will remind all today, unless you are born again, you'll never be in God's kingdom. You'll never be in God's family. It has oftentimes been pointed out, if the Lord Jesus had presented this truth to the woman in the next chapter, the woman at the well of Sychar. We would have said, well, she certainly needed a radical change. But when the Savior presented the truth of the new birth, he presented it to one of the most religious, upright, respectable men that he had ever met when he was here. You know, if religion and respectability would have taken a person to heaven. Nicodemus was on his way. But said the Savior to this man, don't be surprised when I tell you, you must be born again. The hymn writer said, if I could boast the life that you know it will, among all the multitudes of fallen men, judgment at last must be the solemn sequel. The best must perish, if not born again. And I will ask all in this meeting this afternoon, have you ever experienced the new birth? Said the Lord Jesus, don't be surprised when I tell you, you must be born again. Well, you might well ask today, why do I need to be born again? Why do I need to be born of the Spirit of God? I give you at least two good reasons for that. You and I, we need to be born again because of the nature of our heart. I read in Jeremiah 17 and verse 9, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Every one of us today, we have a heart problem. You know, when God looked down upon the people in the days of Noah in Genesis 6, it says that every imagination of man's heart was only evil continually, and things haven't improved. You and I, when we come into this world, we were born with a nature that is sinful, a nature that is rebellious and wayward to the things of God. That is why we need this radical change. This is vital, dear friend. This is absolutely essential. You must be born again. But not only do we need to be born again because of the nature of the heart, we need to be born again because of the nature of heaven. You see, heaven is holy. The psalmist in Psalm 20 and verse 6 spoke about his, God's holy heaven. I read in Revelation 21 that not that defiler shall ever enter in. We used to sing a little chorus with the boys and girls. There is a city bright, closed are its gates to sin. Not that defileth, not that defileth, shall ever enter in. You see, you and I, we need to be born again because of heaven. Some people have this fanciful idea that somehow or other, God will take me in, in, into his heaven. I've lived a reasonable life. I've never done any, anyone any harm. God will take me into heaven. My dear friend, let me say to you kindly today, if you were taken into heaven without the new birth, you would be absolutely miserable. You would just be like a fish out of water. You need the new birth. You need to be born of the Spirit of God. 
to enjoy the things of God now and to enjoy the things of God eternally. That is why the Lord Jesus would say to this man and would say to all this afternoon, don't be surprised when I tell you, you must be born again. You notice the Lord Jesus didn't say to this learned religious man, Nicodemus, it would be a good thing if you ever thought about being born again. You should consider the new birth sometime. He was telling him it was absolutely essential. You must be born again. Well, said this man, how can these things be? You're telling me that I need a new life? That I need to be born again? How can that happen? Well, the Lord Jesus directed Nicodemus to a man that, or to a story that he would have well known in the Old Testament. Story of Numbers 21. It was the story of the children of Israel going through the wilderness and they murmured against God and against Moses and they despised the manner that God had provided for them. And God sent fiery serpents among them and they bit the people and many of the children of Israel were dying. What did they need? Life. They needed physical life, just as you and I need spiritual life. We need eternal life. And they came to Moses and they said, we have sinned. Well, that was a good starting point. It's a tremendous thing when the individual is prepared to face up to the fact of their sin. For remember, your sin is against God. And I say to you again, if not pardoned and forgiven, it will close heaven's door against you forever. But they said more than that. They said to Moses, ask God to remove these serpents from us. What were they wanting? An anti-serpent campaign. Get rid of the serpents. What use would that have been to those that were already bitten? No use at all. They were wanting an, an anti-serpent campaign. Yet there are many like that today. And when they begin to think about their sin, they say, well, I'll turn over a new leaf. I'll make a fresh start. I'll try my best. That's only putting a patch in the problem. God was going to do more than take away the serpents. He said to Moses, Make a serpent of brass, lift it up on the pole. And if the serpent hath bitten anyone, when they would look to that serpent, they would live. They would get life. And then said the Lord Jesus to this man, just as Moses lifted up that serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal Life. What a provision God made in Numbers 21. A serpent on a pole. What you say to me, was it not a serpent that bit them? It was. But this serpent was different. This serpent lifted up on the pole had no sting. Let me assure you that the one that was lifted up on the cross was absolutely perfect. He was sinless, spotless and pure. A serpent of brass. You know, brass in our Bible is the symbol of judgment. And the Lord Jesus that was lifted up on the cross, he was the one that bore the judgment on account of your sin and mine. Isaiah 53, written something like 700 years before it happened. Isaiah could pen the words, but he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement, the punishment that brought about our peace was on him. And because he bore the stroke of judgment, we can be healed. We can be pardoned. We can be forgiven. What a provision God made in Numbers 21. What a greater provision he has made for you and I. Giving his own son, we have read already today. For God so loved the world that he gave 
his only begotten son. Give him up to the sufferings of the cross. Meet it out to his perfect son. The judgment on account of our sin. And he did it all. That whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And what a message went out that day. If the serpent had bitten anyone, when they would look to God's provision, they would get life. I want to tell you that today. If you have learned the need of being born again, let me present to you again God's great provision in the person of his son. And a look of faith to him. You can know pardon and forgiveness. Whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. You know, the message was clear. It's just a simple look. You know, sin came in by a look. I read of Eve in Genesis 3. She saw that the tree was good for food. But sin can be pardoned through a look of faith to God's provision. The message was plain. The message was personal. You know, everyone had to look for themselves. I've mentioned already the manna. When it came to the manna, one could help the other out. But when it came to getting life, it was a personal look of faith. I ask you this afternoon, would you look away to Christ? He is your own, own, only hope. Our Bible says, neither is there salvation in any other. There is no other name under heaven given among men, whereby we must be saved. The message was plain. The message was personal. The message was powerful. When they would look, those that were bitten. Well, they began to feel a little better, and not at all. As soon as they looked, they got life. And that's how you could get eternal life this afternoon. By looking away to Christ and putting your trust and faith alone in him. He would say to you today in the language of Isaiah 45 and 22, look unto me and be a saved, all the ends of the earth, for I am God and there is none else. It was Amelia Hull, just as a girl of 20, the very night that she trusted Christ, she penned those beautiful words, there is life for a look at the crucified one. There is life at this moment for thee. Then look, sinner, look unto him and be saved. Unto him who was nailed to the tree. Why was he there as the bearer of sin? If on Jesus my guilt was not laid, or why from his side flowed that sin cleansing time, if his dying my death had not been? I wonder today, have you learned the must of being born again? But also learn the must of a Savior that was lifted up for sinners upon the cross, just as Moses. Lifted up that serpent in the wilderness. Even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. That whosoever. That if any, anyone at this meeting this afternoon. If whosoever believeth in him. Should not perish. But have eternal life. You can leave this meeting this afternoon. The possessor of eternal life. Through faith alone, in Christ alone, whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Shall we pray? Our Father, we draw near to thee at the close of our gathering. Thank thee for the opportunity of being here. Thank thee for the privilege of reading thy word and we know that thy word is able to make one wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. It was a tremendous evening for Nicodemus when he learned the need of being born again and he learned how 
he could come into the good of eternal life through faith in an uplifted spirit. May that thou bless thy word, or bless all that have taken the time and the effort of being here. We ask it in the precious name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.